Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Jay and welcome to Simple Church Online. Whether you missed last Sunday, you're checking us out for the first time, or maybe even watching out of state, we're so glad that you're a part of our community. And we're praying today that as you watch, God would use this to bless your life. Enjoy the message. We jump into, back into Psalm 23. I just had this, this feeling or spidey sense or whatever the heck you want to call it, but I just feel like there's somebody here today that just needs to know that it's okay to let go. Like, whatever you're holding on to, whatever fear you have about God, like it's okay to let go. And if that's for anybody in here, or maybe just for me sometimes today, uh, these songs kind of bring that out, that, that we, can, we can sink deep into Him, into who He is. He loves us. He's not mad at us. He's, he, he forgives us. And so if that's for you today, man, just trust that God loves you, that he is here for you. And so we're going to jump back into the series, Psalm 23. If you were here last week, uh, we covered a very difficult verse. Um, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Uh, and it was a very fitting time uh, for some things that we've walked through uh, as a church family. And so hopefully for you, that was comforting as well. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, a little bit more about what does it look like to walk through the valley. Before we do that, I'm, I, I want to read Psalm 23 again. I think it's always good for us to hear Scripture over and over again. And so this is what Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear, fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We've been talking about this uh, for weeks now. We've been looking at David, who was a shepherd, when he wrote these words, what was he actually trying to say? What, what, was, he, what was he trying to, to declare about God as he walked through these seasons of life? And as we talked about last week, we will walk through valleys. Um, there will be difficult seasons in our life. That's, that's part of life. That's just the way that life is. We're going to walk through tough stuff. But last week we talked about who can carry us through those valleys and what God will do if we allow him. And so if last week was the who and the what, then this is the how. How do we actually do that? We didn't get to talk about that last week, but how do we actually allow God to help us walk through the valleys in life? And if you're walking through something difficult right now, I would just say as a Christ follower, man, this is the roadmap to get through the valley, to have joy, to have peace in the valley. In your darkest times, God can give you peace and joy. I fully believe that with all of my heart. Did I believe it early on in ministry, early on as a Christ follower? No. It sounded good. I wish that it was true. But I truly, in the depths of my soul, believe that Christ followers have a hope, a peace that surpasses all understanding, that as they walk through the darkest times in their life, they can have joy and peace. And to be honest with you, without that, I don't know where hope, joy, peace comes from. I'm brokenhearted for people who have to walk through valleys without the knowledge of Jesus and what he has done for us. It breaks my heart for them. And so as we go out into, into streets, into to our, our jobs, into places like that, we need to realize that people are walking around hopeless. They're not our enemy. We're not against them. The enemy is Satan. The enemy is the one who comes to kill and steal and destroy everything in our lives. Jesus came that we would have life and life more abundantly. So the second part of, of 23.4 20, is your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And that's kind of a weird statement, to be honest with you. And, it, and it, it, you know, it's not one that gets talked about much. And it's just kind of thrown in here in the midst, it seems like. But this was a really important, when David wrote this, this was, may have been one of the most important statements that he made in all of Psalm 23, which is saying a lot. So how can we walk through the valleys. Well, as shepherds would take their, their flock on these treks through the valleys to get to the, the grass for summer and then back through for winter, they would have to carry very minimal things with them. And so nowadays, most hunters uh, in, in the Middle East and East Africa and those places, they'll carry a rifle and a staff and like a knapsack with a few things in it, and that's it. Well, back in David's day, literally all the shepherd took with them was a pack for food and a, and a rod and a staff. 
And so these two, th- these two items that they took with them became the most important thing to a shepherd. So again, when David's writing this, this isn't just thrown in in the middle of Psalm 23. He's like, this is how. This is why I can say that we can walk through the valley because I know who God is and I know what he has with him. From a young age, a shepherd boy would go out, and, and we've been looking at this book um, called a, look at, uh, a Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23, and this is a, a, a guy who was an, an actual shepherd and a pastor, and so he has some, a unique perspective on this, and he talks about seeing this and doing this himself, and they would go out from a young age, and they would find a sapling, and they would begin to whittle it down, they would begin to make this rod that they would use for the rest of their life, and, and they would craft it specifically to their hand, and these young boys, they would practice throwing these, these rods, and they would get so good at it that, that they could act kill a snake with it if they needed to. There's still competitions today uh, for rod throwing over in Africa uh, with these things, and so it became an extension of the shepherd's hand. Now it's known as a knob carry, and I, we have a picture of it right here, and so this is kind of uh, what they would look like. Uh, other one, that's, that's the second one, yeah, sorry Cody. That, so here, this is, these are examples of what's called knob carries or rods that the shepherds would use, and so they're, they're smaller and they had a, basically a club end on it for protection, and then they could literally throw it uh, like a dart uh, and use it for protection. So, so this became the first line of defense for shepherds. So it was, it was an important piece for them. It wasn't just uh, you know, this, this thing that they had. They weren't just whittling for fun. Like This was an important piece of shepherding. We see in Exodus when God calls Moses to go free the Israelites. Moses is like, I, I don't really want to go. I love Moses because he was just for real. He's like, I can't speak. I, I stutter. Like, how are they going to even know that, that you said that I'm supposed to go? And so God says, take, take your rod with you. And when you throw it down, it'll turn into a snake. And, and if you've seen Charlton Heston do all that in the, in the movie, uh, Ten Commandments, then you kind of know how that goes. But it was, this, the rod was God's proof, God's word of who he was to Pharaoh to let my people go. So the, the rod that the knob carry is God's word in our life. It's the power and the authority and the strength of God's word. Now, the rod was used for several, several things with sheep, but there was a confidence in the sheep. There was a calming sense. When, when that shepherd walked out there with that rod, they knew that they were protected. So there was a, a peace, a, a comfort just in seeing that, just in the shepherd having that, but there's a few things that it was used for. First off, it was used to ward off enemies. That's an obvious one. That was one of the most important things. It was their first line of defense. Uh, They literally would fight off cougars and mountain lions and bears and tigers and lions and oh my and all that stuff, right? So it was was one of the, the first line of defense, and God's word in our life should be our first line of defense. It should be the thing that immediately comes out. You, you, get, you, you go to your job, and, and people are, are, are being rude to you. Your boss is being rude to you. The first thing that should come out of our minds is Scripture. Can we be honest? Can we be honest? Bro, I work at a church. You think the first thing I think is Scripture sometimes? No. You think Matthew comes sassing me, and I'm just like, hey. Hey, buddy. No. <laughs> Lord bless you and keep you, sir. No, right? Let's, let's be honest. Some of you have seen me in ball games. <laughs> I'm protective of my people, right? Like, the first thing is not scripture all the time. Maybe some scripture that's not like nice towards the other people. <laughs> like, you're going to burn. You're going to burn. No, anyway. Should be our first line of defense, man. It should be the first thing that we think. And we see that in Jesus, He is our example of this. Jesus has come to earth, he's been baptized, he's about to start his ministry, first he's taken away, and he fasts for 40 days. Now, we can't do that, we don't have the physical capability of doing that, but Jesus was able to do that. And so after 40 days of fasting, Jesus is, is he's, he's strange, remember he's fully man, so he's tired, he's worn out, and this is when the devil came to attack him. How true is that in our lives? When we're at our lowest, man, Satan loves to come and just kick us while we're down. 
This is what he tries to do to Jesus. And so I want to read this exchange real quick because this is exactly how we should be, how we should use the rod in our life. And it says this, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry, obviously. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you're the son of God, jump off, for the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. But Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. We see Jesus, God himself, his first line of defense was scripture. Here's what scripture says. Bring everything to me. He, he, he brought everything before him. The, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, all of it. Here it is. You can have it. And Jesus says, no, no, no. This, this is what's written. This is what Scripture says. And for us, it should be our first line of defense. And I would just challenge you, if that's not what naturally comes out of you, remember that Scripture says that what comes out of the mouth flows from the heart. <laughs> out of the heart, the mouth speaks. We may need to think about what we're speaking. How are we talking to our kids? How are we reacting to situations at work? How are we reacting to situations that, that, that aren't, you know, the, the greatest? And, and again, we're not going to be perfect. We're not Jesus, right? But we should be striving to, to, to be more like him. How are we doing at using Scripture as our first line of defense? It's also used to discipline wayward sheep, and I've heard so many preachers preach about the rod being just this. And, and they'll preach about, you know, they use these rods to break the, the sheep's leg if they were acted up. And I'm like, yeah, there's some truth to that, but that's, that's, not, that's not what it was about. It, it, so many preachers like to, to use this to, to, you know, be some tough love kind of thing. It's discipline. There's such a difference between abuse and discipline. And God is perfect in his discipline. And so, yes, it, if, if there was a sheep that was about to run off a cliff, is there a sheep about to run into a briar patch that they get stuck in to run into a river that they're going to be in trouble? They would throw that thing and they'd hit it right in the side. Why? Because they're angry? No, because they love that sheep. They have, they have a connection with these. Shepherds had a connection with these sheep. And so everything that they did was to protect and love that sheep. And sometimes that meant, meant discipline. Scripture tells us in Proverbs 12, and this is what I love about Scripture. To learn, you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. That's why I love the NLT. It doesn't pull any punches. It says, this is what it says. It's stupid to hate correction. If we trust God, if we trust that he is big enough to create everything and then send Jesus to die in our place, we should be able to trust him with correcting us when we need to be corrected. And guess what? We're sheep. We go astray. We need to be corrected. I'd rather have my leg broken than fall off a cliff. True maturity is when we delight in the discipline of the Lord. That's what Hebrews says. Nobody likes it for a time. It's like, we're not crazy. Like, yeah, please discipline me. We don't go to our parents and be like, hey, I really want you to discipline me. Like, could you just ground me? I feel like I need it. Like, my clothes are everywhere. I said I were going to pick them up, but I haven't yet. Will you just, will you just discipline me? No, I'm just saying in general, like, those kind of things happen. My son, hates when I, my son hates when I pick on him. God loves who he disciplines. He says we're a legitimate child because he disciplines us, because he cares for us. The third thing that the rod does is it's used to examine the sheep. And so sheep have very, very big wool, Right? And that you can't always detect disease, so what they would do is they, they can use the rod to press down the wool to examine the sheep, to see what's inside there, what needs uh, to be cured, what needs to be healed, what, what's infected, what needs to come out. And if we will allow it, 
as we read scripture, what it does is it examines our heart. Psalm 139, 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. We need to pray that prayer over and over. See, uh, uh, Psalm 139, we love it because it's like, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah, but because of that, he also has the authority to examine our lives and say, hey, this isn't adding up. A, A is not equaling B here. Like so, something's not right and we need to get rid of the stuff that's not right. And if we will allow him, again, it's all about your view of God. If God is an angry, waiting to get you cosmic coffee, yeah, then, then you're going to think, oh boy, it's all, this is all about anger and frustration, and he's mad at me. If you see God as who he is, a loving, just, good God, then all these things, you, you'll find joy in them. Thank you, God, that you care about me, a singular human. You care enough to examine my heart and get rid of the stuff that's ruining my life. Thank you, God. That's the place that we should be. And that's why the, the rod, even though it was used at times to discipline the sheep, was a comfort and a peace to the sheep when they saw it. Because they knew the care that the shepherd had in them. Listen, if we will allow it, God has given us the roadmap to everything that we need to know about. That decision we need to make. That thing that we're going through. The, the, the way to raise our kids. The way to love our spouses. It's all right here. We, we, I feel like sometimes we, we think that God has created this all to be a mystery. Figure it out, guys. Good luck, but you better get it right because there's only one way to heaven. You better figure it out. No multiple choice here. No, he, in his goodness, mapped it out all to us. You know, Romans tells us that, the, the, that nature cries out who God is so that we're without an excuse. If God gave us nothing, no scripture, anything like that, then, then just the nature that we see, the, the way that the world was created pulls us to God to say there must be something more. But God in his goodness didn't just leave it there. He gave us this scripture that is tied together and beautiful and the roadmap. but we have to allow it into our lives. It does no point if it sits, no, no good if it sits on a shelf or if we don't allow it into our hearts. So I'll just challenge you, you want to have joy, you want to have peace as you walk through the valleys, get in God's word. Read your Bible. If you're not reading, if you're not reading five, five minutes a day, start there. Read a chapter a day somewhere. Start in Matthew. Start, start in, in Revelation. No, I'm just kidding. Don't no, start in Revelation. <laughs> don't, don't do that, okay? Start in Numbers. No, I'm just kidding. All Scripture is great. All Scripture is God-breathed. It's, it's there for, for all kinds of things. But start in Matthew. Uh, start in John. Find a way to, to learn about who God is and what he did for you. I'm telling you, it will bring comfort and peace like you've never seen. The second piece of this, so the, the rod is God's word. The other thing that the shepherds had is a staff. You can go ahead and throw that picture back up. And this is kind of the thing that, that we know about shepherds. So if you see a picture of a shepherd or, or something like that, or this is kind of the, the they're sitting there holding that with the, the crook or the hook, as they call it there, uh, the shepherd's staff. So this is kind of what they were known for. And it's in the same way, they, they would craft this out of a, a small tree, and they would, over time, craft it to where it was perfectly fit to their hand. They would use it for several things here as well. But it was designed for sheep specifically. The, this, the shepherd's crook or the shepherd's hook will not work for any other cattle. Horses, uh, you know, any other thing like that, it will not work. It's specifically designed for sheep to meet the needs of sheep so what it is it's a, what it's a sign it's a symbol of the care and concern that a shepherd has for their sheep this was all about taking care of the sheep so whereas the rod is this authority and power and strength this is all about compassion and care and in the life of the christian this symbolizes the holy spirit the comforter and if I can just say this, and, and we're going to get into some tough stuff here in a little while. I think that so many people fall short in Christianity because they never activate the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. I think they've never truly experienced what it means to be in an intimate relationship with God because they've never activated the Holy Spirit in their life. 
there's three things that, that the staff does for the sheep. One of the first things that it does is it, is it draws sheep together. So when a, a ewe has a lamb and, and the lamb starts to wander off, the shepherd will take that hook and he'll hook, gently hook that lamb and, and bring it back to its mom because if he touches it, then she may reject him because of the human smell on him. So the first thing that this hook does is it brings, unites people back together. And in our lives as Christ followers, one of the greatest things that the Spirit does is that He draws us into a relationship with one another. Now this is, this is vital for us. There is no such thing as being a Christ follower on your own. That's a farce. You, you cannot do church online by yourself and not interact. That's not, it was never meant to be that way. The church is a body, and every single person makes up that body and is vital to that body. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was praying before his death, and praying to the Father. This, this is what he prayed. John chapter 17, starting in verse 20. I'm praying not only for the disciples, his guys right now, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I've given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Jesus, praying this, looks out into the future, 2024, and his prayer is that we would come together as a family and that we would be so close and so loving and caring of one another that the world looks and says, what is that? Wow. Look how much they love each other. Look how much they care for each other. They put out a meal train and it was snatched up in like two minutes. What is this? We were created to be in relationship. And what the Spirit does is it harmonizes us. It brings us together. It challenges us to be a part of what's going on here. And I, I, I'm sorry, and this, this may step on some toes. If you're at a church where you can't be known, that church is too big or they, they have not done enough to get you connected and plugged in. Now, there's, there's, sometimes you're just lazy and you want to sit on the sidelines and not be plugged in. That's on you. But you need to be somewhere where you're connected with other people. That's how it was meant to be. And that's the, the job of the Spirit is to draw us together. Another thing that the staff does is that it gently guides the sheep. And so again, as they start to stray, all that shepherd has to do is just press that against their side and they know exactly what that is, and they'll go wherever that, that staff leads them. And it guides them and directs them. And again, John speaking, or uh, J Jesus speaking in John about the Holy Spirit. You have to understand, here, here's what's so important to understand about the Holy Spirit. And, and this is maybe one of the most incredible things about Scripture to me. Jesus says, it is better for me. God himself, dwelling on earth, it is better for me to leave so that the Holy Spirit can come. Yet this Holy Spirit, we treat it like this weird ghost, like, hey, buddy, like, like it's going to be uh, Patrick Swayze in us and, and all that. You know, like it's something weird's going to happen because the Holy Spirit, like, stop touching me, you know, or whatever. Like, we're so weird about the Holy Spirit when Jesus himself said, no, I need to go because it's going to be better for you. Because I'm here with you, he's going to be in you, in your heart. He's going to give you the power and the strength that you need because the battles are coming. And it's going to give you everything that you need to walk through that. It gently and humbly directs us where to go. And in John 16, 13, Jesus says this. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has, he has heard. He will tell you about the future. The spirit is there to guide us where we need to go. I don't know about you, but there are some times in my life I feel lost. There's some times when I'm like, you know, I, I turn 44 next week. And I'm like, when am I going to feel like an adult? <laughs> you know, I, I feel like I'm 25. Like, I walk into church sometimes and I'm like, how am I the lead pastor of a church? This is crazy. I got nothing together. Like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing with my life, right? You ever felt like that? You ever just woke up and, and just wonder like, I remember when we took our kids home, and, and not as bad as with Evan, but certainly with Emma. We were, I was, what, 27 at that point? 
And I thought, shame on you, hospital. <laughs> you just let us walk out. I don't know what I'm doing. This thing cries nonstop. Take it back. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> not anymore. I'm glad. Especially now that you have a job. So, uh, <laughs> It's the Holy Spirit's job to guide us. The greatest, the greatest thing that ever happened to me was the pain that I walked to to learn surrender. I didn't want to walk through it. I questioned God, why would you do this to me? And he said, because you're, read Proverbs 12. <laughs> you're kind of stupid. <laughs> it's okay, God talks to me that way. I allow him to, it's fine. Because you think you got it figured out. You think you can handle it. You think you can keep things together and you can't. You weren't meant to. You don't know what's going to happen next, but you know who does? The Holy Spirit. And he'll guide you, and he'll lead you if you'll allow him. And I would just say, if you've never given, if you've never fully surrendered yourself, you're missing out on about 85% of Christianity. <laughs> if I can just be honest with you. And you're going to walk away disappointed. And I'm tired of seeing it, man. I'm tired of the deconstruction thing. And I just want to sit down with those people, and I want to say, have you ever fully surrendered? Have you really get, ha, did you really allow the Spirit to lead you and guide you? Because I think that you're missing out. The third thing that the staff does is it rescues the sheep. Um, again, there's times that we walk through really difficult situations. There's times that we create really difficult situations. Sheep are dumb. There's a reason the Bible calls us sheep. A sheep will, trying to get a little more food, will slide down an embankment. A sheep, trying to get more food, will walk off a cliff. That's how dumb these things are. Thinking there may be more food inside of a briar patch, it, it, a sheep will go in there until it gets stuck and cannot get itself out. And so what a shepherd does is it, it gets the staff and it can scoop it out of the water. It can bring it up the embankment. It can do its job to help fix the situation. And the same is true when we allow the Spirit to guide us. He will gently correct us and bring us back to the right path. He will lead us into life everlasting if we allow Him to. I want to read Galatians chapter 5 to you because I think it's really important for us to understand this piece that we have, we have got to give up control if we really want. There's a reason that, that Jesus said, if you really want to gain life, you have to lose it. You have to really let go. It's not this, I said one prayer and I'm in now. No, it's, it is full sacrifice, death, I'm dead, I'm a new person, and I'm Jesus's. Like that, that is what Christianity is. And I think that we fall so short of that. And so Paul, in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16, says this. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. The Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you're, no, you're not under obligation to the law of Moses. There, True, remember, Galatians is all about freedom because the, there were these people going back to Mo, the law of Moses, trying to follow all 672 rules again. And, and Paul's like, no, listen, you don't understand. Jesus came to give you freedom, to truly set you free. And what the Holy Spirit does is that it guides you into that freedom. The Holy Spirit says, stop going back over there. That's not good for you. Stop pulling that up on the Internet. It's not helping you. Stop treating your spouse this way. Stop doing this to your kids. Because God's mad at you? No, because the Spirit wants to guide you on the path that leads to righteousness and life everlasting. It's the job of the Holy Spirit. We have to allow the Spirit to lead us in that. I, I want to read one, one more thing in, in Romans, and I think this is important. And I want, I want to read Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And, and most of you, if you've been in church, you, you know this scripture right here. It says this. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And I love that scripture, and I've used it this last week 
talking to people who are going through different, very difficult situations. I believe this with all of my heart, that God will use for good what, what Satan meant for evil, if we allow him to. But there's some scripture before that. Verse 27, what leads us to be able to have the good out of it? Verse 27 says this, And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. So the Spirit, when we pray, it intercedes for us to God. And what it does is it connects with God's will, and then God uses that for the good in our life. Now I want to talk about some really difficult truths here, and I want you to stay with me. When I go to hospitals, when I pray with people, I always pray. I want, I want miracles to happen. I want God to take away. I want him to heal. But my prayer will always be, God, your will be done. It took me a long time to get there. It took me a long time to realize that sometimes God's will is for them to not be healed. And true maturity comes when we can thank God even for that. I'm not saying I'm always there. I'm not saying it's always easy. But I will always pray God's will be done. Because that's where I truly connect. When God can truly bring good out of that valley is when I say, whatever happens, God, you are good. They get healed. They don't get healed. That, that, that relationship is restored. It doesn't get restored. God, you are good no matter what. There was a, I was just walking by there this morning in our 56ers room. And the board says, fear says, what if? God says, even if. Courage says, even if. Faith says, even if. True maturity is when we get to a place where we say, God, no matter what. I look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing before King Nebuchadnezzar, before that furnace. And they say, even if God doesn't save us from the furnace, we'll never bow to you. That's the faith that the Spirit gives us if we allow it. And when we pray and when we get in God's word, it aligns us with God's will for our life. It, it gets rid of the selfish desires that we have and it focuses on what God wants for our life. And when that happens, we begin to, to find peace even in, in the storm. Philip, the guy who wrote this book that we've been going through, talks in length about his wife's battle with cancer. And he talks about sitting there with her as the, the moments were passing away, singing hymns together, and singing her up to the mountaintop. And was it heartbreaking for him? Absolutely. But even in that, he found joy in knowing the end of the story, that his wife was healed and whole. She was no longer hurting. That's the kind of faith that we should have. So to answer the question, how do we go through the valley? You ready for it? Take some notes. It's about to blow your mind. Read your Bible and pray. Church, there's, there's no secret sauce here. There's no mystery. Read your Bible and pray. The answers are here. The intimate connection's there. Read your Bible and pray. We overcomplicate this. I want you to think about basketball. I, I had the privilege of coaching for seven years. I got to coach my son's team, and then Emma played a few years, and, and so I got to coach them. And Oh, girls, man, they're, they're a hoot. They're, I'm telling you what, you want to see some girls get after it, some people get after it, and some fouling and some hacking. I was like, I started coaching girls, and I'm like, holy cow, this is like third grade, and they're like starting fights. I'm like, whoa, I'm not ready for this. Kindergarten's when we started, and we taught them offense and defense. We taught them the basics, right? got a little bit further along and you know they're up in the the third fourth fifth grade they start competing a little bit higher level you know what we taught them offense and defense they have gotten to middle school guess what the, the coaches taught them offense and defense he's in high school now gonna play on the high school teams we're teaching them offense and defense one day i think he's gonna go to college i'm, I'm speaking that over you right now you have to learn to beat me first if you want to get to college but anyway 
When he gets to, when he gets to college, they're going to te- teach him offense and defense. He may make it to the NBA. That's my dream. That was my dream growing up. Didn't happen. <laughs> God said, you're white and short, so let's let that die. <laughs> if he makes it to the NBA, they're going to teach him offense. You used to teach defense. <laughs> but here's, here's what's funny. Here's what's funny. They, they, they don't do defense like they used to back in the day. Now, you can call me an old head or whatever. Go watch some film of Jordan trying to go down the paint and see what happened to him. You know, it wasn't a tick and LeBron going, ah! <laughs> Not a LeBron fan. I don't know if you can pick that out. Uh, ah! That's LeBron every time. Sorry. Just, I hope he sees this. 1v1 me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he would dominate me. <laughs> but you know what they say? That, that, that they're not doing defense anymore? They're losing the spirit of the game. Isn't that funny? Doesn't matter, kindergarten through the NBA, offense and defense. Church, your kids back there in the two-year-old classroom are learning, read your Bible and pray. And we grow up in this complicated, fast-paced world, and we think, what? okay, what's the secret? What else? Read your Bible and pray. Okay, this is going to hurt a little bit. We had a, we had a kid <laughs> on our team uh, who was not good. And, and, and as if you have played ball from kindergarten on, you know that you have to play these kids, uh, which is the dumbest rule of all time. We need to teach kids, if you're, if, if you're not good, move on. But anyway, <laughs> talk sports with me. It's a, it's a joy. I have a whole lot of ideas. But anyway, <laughs> here's your participation trophy. Uh, so he was, he was not good. He didn't want to be there. His parents made him play. Uh, he would sit down on the court, uh, and that didn't sit well with me. I'm, not a, I'm a little bit passionate. I'm yelling at kindergartners like, oh, dunk the ball. What are you doing? But, so he, he, was, he would sit down on the court. He was, he was a good defender when we were on offense. I'll say that. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's where his defense shone. And... Uh, it was, it was probably, he probably played for probably about three years, and it was maybe our third grade year, and uh, we, we lost in the playoffs. We lost a really difficult game, and so I'm over there, you know, giving the, the, the coach's speech and just telling him, you know, you guys played so good. We're going to come back next year. We're going to be strong. Right in the middle of that, this kid cuts me off and says, I think I'm going to try piano next year, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm giving this speech, and I look at him and said, that's a great idea, and I just went right back into, <laughs> right back into my speech. Church, can I be a little bit hard on us? That kid was hurting our team because he didn't care. He didn't want to do offense. He didn't want to do defense. I wonder where are the Christ followers who love offense and defense? Where are the Christ followers who are so serious about their faith and wanting to truly have that joy that they're getting up and they're reading their Bible? that they're praying every day. I'm a big Jordan and Kobe fan. And the reason that I love them so much and the reason that I think that they're they're the top two is because they loved everything about the game. They they loved offense. They loved defense. They wanted to be the best at it. And I would just say, church, where where are the Kobe's and the Jordans of faith? There, There are some that I see, but there's a whole lot of faithless, spiritless Christians in this world right now. And you're hurting the team. Because there is a world that looks at you and when you go through difficult situations, you break down. Just like, listen, I've I've said this from the very beginning. I want you to hear my heart. You're going to go through difficult stuff. I'm not looking down on you for going through difficult stuff. I'm not looking down on you for having anger and fear and pain. But at some point, if this stuff is true, it will come out of us even in our darkest times. And there is a world that is looking and waiting to see what do they do in the midst of grief? What do they do in the midst of pain? How do they handle that news? How do they handle that? How do they deal with that? How do they... And I would just ask you today, do you love God's word? Do you love the fact that you have a straight line to God? I'm telling you what's, what's going to happen when we get to heaven. We're going to stand before David and Moses and all these people, 
and they're going to say, wait, 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 what? You had the spirit living in you? That's incredible. You must have, you must have spent your days doing nothing but praying. You must have picked up God's word because the Spirit guides you into God's word and what it means and helps you. You must have just read your Bible every day. And we'll say, bro, you've got to understand about TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and Netflix and baseball and bat. You don't know. And David will be like, what? I don't know if he can slap people in heaven, but he might. <laughs> I'd be okay with that probably a pretty strong slap from David, but church, I, I, I'm not here to condemn you. That's not my job. This is, you know, anytime you point out, you got three fingers coming back at you, right? I, this is not condemnation at all. One of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to convict us, and if we need to be convicted because we're not getting into his word and we're not praying, then let the Holy Spirit convict us all day, and if you want to be the church that doesn't challenge you in that stuff, go find a fluff church. That's fine. <laughs> See what happens when you walk through the valley. Anyway, <laughs> if you're new, listen, this is we don't, there's no time to pull punches. You don't know what you're going to wake up with tomorrow. You don't know if there's going to be a doctor's appointment tomorrow that you didn't know about, that something's going to come up. We don't know these things. There's no time to say, let's baby our way through this. No, grow up. That's what the Spirit is here for, to help us. We have the Spirit. We have the force that can walk us through the valleys, and we don't use it. No, church, we got to wake up. we got to do life different. Get into the Word. Carve out time. If you're too busy, cut everything else out of your life. Quit your, I would rather you quit your job to be able to read your Bible if that's what it takes. We, it, there's no more playing games. You're hurting the team if you don't love offense and defense. And it's time for the church to change. Why? Why am I challenging you? Why am I so passionate about this? Because I know that there is a different way to live life that so many Christ followers are not living. It breaks my heart that they don't experience the fullness of who God is. That they don't experience the goodness of God. That they walk away because they think that God is mean. That's not the God that I serve. I want you to be able to walk through the valleys with your head held high. Are you mad? Are you angry? Do you have questions? Yes, David did. Job did. They asked God, absolutely. But at some point they said, you know what? Your ways are higher than mine. Your thoughts are higher than mine. You're God and I'm not. I trust you no matter what. And at some point, church, we've got to get there. And in that is this freedom that comes from, I'm not in charge of the outcome. That's God's. I'm going to pray my prayers. I'm going to walk as best as I can. The outcome is God's. And whatever that looks like, that's his. You get to that place in your life, you're going to be set free. You're going to be a dangerous Christian. Because who's, who's going to stop you? When that's your mindset, whatever happens, come what may, bring it. That's a scary Christian. That's a Christian that changes the world. That's a Christian that changes the narrative of God for a world that needs it. It changes you. It'll change your family. It'll change your kids when you live that way. What's the fix? Read your Bible and pray. If you're not doing it, two minutes a day, five minutes a day. 15 minutes a day. You're doing it 30 minutes a day, do it 45 minutes a day. You cannot do it enough. And I promise you, the more you saturate yourself with this stuff, the, 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 the better life is going to be. Not circumstantial, but in your spiritual heart, the better life is going to be. That's my prayer for you. Once again, thank you for stopping by today. We'd love for you to be a part of our family at one of our services. You can find out all of our information at simplechurchtulsa.com. And we'd love to pray for you any way we can. So please message us and we hope you have a great week.